Good morning, Grace, again. My name is Mark. If you walked in late and you're new here, um, I'm one of the pastors here, along with Clay, who is not here this morning. Um, he's still in the hospital, and we're hopeful that he will be released soon. But if you have been with us over the past month, you will know that we've been going through the book of Hebrews, uh, starting from the beginning, and we're going to uh, work our way right through to the end of the book over the next while. We love to go through books of the Bible here at Grace Fellowship. We tend um, to go through books of the Bible rather than topical sermons. We, we still do topical sermons once in a while, but um, we feel, for the most part, it's best for us to go through books of the Bible and allow these books of the Bible to dictate the topics as we go through them. And so we find this method does a few things for us. It doesn't allow us as pastors to just pick topics that we want and continually ride our hobby horses, so to speak. And it makes us go where the passage goes. If a difficult subject arises, we go through them as scriptures dictate that we ought to. And so we find this method also gives us the clearest picture of what the text is actually saying and what the author's intent is with the text. It keeps the passages within their context, giving us this clear view of the surrounding situations, which helps us to see the author's intended message for the intended hearer, which is important. We're not taking a passage out of context and applying it to some other situation, which might give us some skewed view of what the author intended to mean with the words that he wrote. And so we feel that this method uh, does really give us the clearest picture of Jesus Christ and his gospel message. And so today we are in the third chapter of Hebrews. We'll be taking verses 1 to 6 of Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, the whole chapter is going to play out on the screen behind me. Then we're going to dig into the first six verses of this text together. Reading from Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let's just pray before we dig into this text. God, once again, I want to thank you for the book of Hebrews. As we dig further and further into this book, 
We're getting this clearer and pic- clearer picture of your son, Jesus, and also this clear picture of what he's done for us. And I thank you for this picture. I pray that as we navigate through this passage today, that our affections for you would be stirred up and fanned into this giant flame this morning, that you might be glorified and magnified as we, your children, see you clearer and brighter through this passage. pray this in your name. Amen. So, over the past few Sundays, we have uh, given you a fairly detailed look into the lives of the people that this particular book was written to, um, just so you have a good idea of who it was written to and when and why. And so I'm going to assume that you have been here for one or more of those Sundays, and I'm assuming that you will remember some of what We have already taught in regards to the context of this passage, but just as a brief overview though, this passage was written to a group of Jewish uh, people or Hebrews who turned from the Old Testament law, the old covenant religious and political system uh, for the Jews, and and they turned to following Jesus. Now, following Jesus came at a great cost to them. They were persecuted by the Jews and by the Romans who ruled over them. And so these particular people that this book was written to, they felt like giving up. They felt like quitting. They felt like turning back, going back to the Old Testament law. This would appease the Jews and it would appease the Romans. It seemed like life would be just so much better if they went back to the way things were. And so the author of this book, he, he writes this to them to encourage them to keep moving forward, keep loving Jesus, And he attempts to stir up their affections for Jesus by reminding them of who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And he reminds them that Jesus is better than the prophets they had under the Old Testament law. He is better than the angels. And last week we learned Jesus is the better older brother, the better and ultimate high priest. And he's reminding them how great Jesus is so they can see that going back to what they had is a giant step in the wrong direction because Even in suffering and persecution, Jesus is better than all that they had under the Old Testament law. Jesus is better than anything you previously had. You have Jesus. How can you turn back to these uh, inferior things that all just pointed to Jesus? Since the angels pointed them to Jesus, the prophets pointed them to Jesus, and the high priest was a dim and incomplete picture of who Jesus was and what Jesus' role was. And so... This is the author's intent, to stir up the affections of Jesus in these people. And so let's dig into our passage, the first part of verse 1, chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, he says. So the author is continuing on this concept from chapter 2, where he declared that Jesus came to earth as a human, as one of us, as a brother to us, and he was not afraid to call us brothers. In other words, he has adopted us into his spiritual family. So he now addresses these people, or the author now addresses these people as holy brothers. And so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are, you are a brother or sister in Christ, and you get to share in his inheritance. And so because Jesus did this amazing work of adopting us into his family, we get to call one another brothers and sisters. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but we are brothers and sisters, not because we chose to be brothers and sisters with one another, but because Jesus chose us to be a part of his family. That's why the author can call these people brothers. They're a part of the fam because they're children of the father. In this life, you don't choose your brothers or sisters, but they're your family, whether you like it or not. And spiritual family is much the same, only it's much thicker than blood. Your physical family that shares your genetics will only be family while you live here on earth. Your spiritual family is family for eternity. You've been born again into the family of God. This makes us, you and I, family if we believe in Jesus. Just like my earthly brothers and sisters, I didn't choose to be a brother to you. I was adopted, but I was adopted by my heavenly father or born again into this spiritual family. So I'm your brother Because Jesus made me his brother. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ, not because we wanted to choose each other, but rather because Jesus chose us. 
We are in the family because of him. God the Father adopted us into his family to partake in the internal inheritance that should only be for his one and only son, Jesus. And Jesus, the one who shares his eternal inheritance with us, is the one who paid for us to be a part of this family. He paid for our adoption with his life. He was the selfless older brother who gave up everything so that we might have everything that belongs to him. I am your brother because Jesus made me his brother. You are my brothers and sisters because Jesus made you his brothers and sisters. And that brotherhood and sisterhood lasts for eternity. And the author goes even further than just calling these people brothers. He addresses them as holy, meaning pure, clean, set apart for Jesus, brothers and sisters. These people who were so tempted to denounce their faith in Christ, these people who wanted to go back to the Old Testament law, these people who want to give up Jesus for earthly comfort, these are the people he calls holy brothers and sisters. How is that even possible? And, and, and if we look around here in our context today, we might have the same question. If Clay were to have written us a letter from his hospital bed this week to be read out this Sunday morning, could he have addressed it in the same way? Could he have addressed it to Grace Fellowship, his holy brothers and sisters? And if we start to think about that and take an honest look at our lives, we might start to think that, nah, that, that's probably not possible. We're too messed up. We've offended one another. We've hurt someone's feelings. We've said some things that we shouldn't have said. Uh, maybe we've complained about things because of our selfishness. We're proud. We've fallen into temptation to sin. We've failed. How could anyone possibly write to Grace Fellowship and address us as holy? When we see all our failures... Being called holy is, seems like to us that it's impossible. But we're no different than these people to whom the author was writing. They're not called holy brothers and sisters because of how good they are. They're called holy because their sin is forgiven, because they believe in Jesus, who paid for their sin on the cross, washing away the guilt and declaring them holy, and declaring us holy when we deserve to be declared unclean, tainted, unworthy, that's what we deserve, but yet Jesus made it possible for us to be called holy. We are made holy, pure, clean, set apart for Jesus by the work of Jesus on the cross so that God the Father will receive us into his family, making us brothers and sisters with one another and with our elder brother, Jesus Christ. That's how good Jesus is. He didn't only just bring us into his family, but he makes us worthy to be there. And the rest of verse one identifies us as you who share in the heavenly calling. As brothers and sisters, we are partners with Christ on his mission. He allows us to work along with him in his kingdom as part of his family to bring the good news of himself to those whom we come in contact with. We're not worthy of this mission. I'm not worthy to stand here and rejoice in the fact that he made me able to declare the good works of Jesus. We're deserving of death for our sin, but Jesus makes us worthy to share in his calling, to gather for himself a, a group of people to be his family in his household, holy brothers and sisters. Jesus makes us worthy of this work all on his own so we can enter the presence of God with no shame and no guilt because Jesus has washed that away for us. We are holy because he has made us holy. Not because we are an amazing and perfect example of humanity. There was only one person who was ever perfect and his name was Jesus. And he makes us right and good in the eyes of the Father, just as he was right and good. So Jesus, he's done this amazing work of making his people holy, bringing them into his family. 
and sending them to do his work. This is something the Old Testament law could never do for these people, this Old Testament law that they wanted to go back to. It fell, short, it fell far short of creating perfect people. All the law could do was point out how messed up humanity was. It couldn't fix the problem. It could only point it out. So because Jesus was able to do this and to make for himself holy brothers and sisters to serve and serve as a perfect high priest, to be the perfect sacrifice, because Jesus was a true and better everything that the Old Testament law pointed to, he tells these holy brothers and sisters to consider Jesus, the author says. In other words, think very carefully about Jesus and who he is before you give in to the temptation to turn back to your old ways. Before you give up on following Jesus, consider, think about, and understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And this word consider, it brings with it this idea of being drawn towards something. As you, as you think about and understand who Jesus is, be drawn towards him. If somebody's considering something, it's often because they're drawn towards that thing. If you're considering um, buying a new car, it's because you're drawn towards that new car rather than your old one. So you consider buying a new car. You think about the cost. You, you consider all the negative repercussions of buying a new car, the payments. But you're considering it because you really want the car. Can you afford the cost? There's a desire to have it. This is the request of the author towards these people. Consider Jesus, be drawn towards him. Look at who he is and what he has done for you. Consider the price he has paid so that you might be one of his children. That way, when you also think about the cost of following Jesus, which is often persecution and suffering, and specifically for these Hebrew people, it was persecution and suffering, you'll see that it's totally worth it to follow and love Jesus. Jesus is worth any earthly cost. Jesus is better than any earthly comfort. Consider him. Allow your affections for him to be stirred up so that when you feel the costly effects of following him here on this earth, it, it will be worth it to you because you are enamored by the love of Jesus Christ. And the author gives them some very specific things to consider about Jesus still in verse 1. Sorry, we're going to start moving quicker through this passage yet. We're still in verse 1, but we're going to get through the first six verses, I promise. Uh, but he says, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So he tells these people to consider Jesus. Let yourself be drawn to him by thinking about him in this way. He was the perfect apostle. Another, another word for apostle could be an ambassador or a representative of sorts. Jesus had 12 apostles who represented him as he was out and about. They went about from town to town with Jesus, doing the works of Jesus, doing things on his behalf or as his representatives. They would deliver food for Jesus or help the sick for Jesus. They worked for him. Um, going places and doing miracles even in his name or on his behalf. Now, the author here describes Jesus as the ultimate apostle, the perfect ambassador or the perfect representative for God the Father, sent from God the Father to mankind. God the Father sent Jesus to earth to do the work of salvation in his name or on his behalf. Jesus was the perfect and faithful Apostle, And again, the author goes back to the fact that he was the perfect high priest. And I'm not going to go into huge detail about who the high priest is, as I'm really short on time here this morning. And we went through the high priest in detail last Sunday. But the high priest is one who represents humanity to God. And so he was the one each year on the Day of Atonement, he administered the blood of the sacrifice in the presence of God, in the Holy of Holies, in the temple. And so Jesus, he is the true and better apostle sent from God the Father to mankind, and he's the true and better high priest to represent the people to God the Father. So he re represents God the Father to the people and the people to God the Father. Now, this concept might still be maybe a little confusing to us, but to these Jews, it would have made complete sense. Because they had been immersed in the Old Testament laws and traditions from the time that they were children. The author didn't have to explain the importance of the high priest. He didn't have to explain the importance of sacrifice. They knew. But I'm going to try and explain it as best I can for you, as you likely have not been immersed in Old Testament Jewish law since you were young. So Jesus 
comes from God the Father as his ambassador or as his apostle to do his work of saving for himself a people. And as God the Father's ambassador, he brought with him God's love for his people. And Jesus is the proof of God's love for the, his people. And he is the embodiment of God's love for his people. He then, as the embodiment of God's love for his people, administered that love as a high priest, and he became the perfect sacrifice and high priest for his people so they could be freed from sin and brought into his kingdom. If I were to kind of put it in modern terms, it's like, say, the police or emergency workers who carry these naloxone kits with them. I don't know if you've heard about it, but if you were to overdose on an illegal drug called fentanyl, your chances of surviving are not very high. But if 911 is called, the police or the first responders will come to the rescue, and they're going to carry these naloxone kits with them, which is an antidote for the drug overdose. This naloxone can block the effects of the drug for a time and save your life. And so if you happen to overdose on fentanyl, the officer comes to help on, your, or on behalf of the state or the city by which he's employed as, you could say, an ambassador or an apostle, and he comes with a solution to your problem, but he doesn't just leave this solution in front of you for you to figure out what to do with, but he may also administer the antidote on your behalf, you could say as a high priest, so that your life will be saved. And this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. We overdosed on sin. Now, fentanyl is lethal even in small doses. Sin is even worse. Sin, even the smallest amount of sin, is deadly and we die. Romans 6 verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin are death. We were sentenced to die. We were done because we have sinned. And so Jesus came from God the Father on his behalf as God the Father's ambassador or apostle. And he came with the antidote, the perfect sacrifice, his blood, which was shed on the cross. But he didn't just come down and leave the antidote for us to administer on our own because we were dead in our sin. We couldn't administer the antidote. So he did it on our behalf. He administered it for us and delivered the sacrifice to God the Father as payment for sin on our behalf as our high priest. Jesus, the author, the one who designed and planned, and the finisher, the one who carried it out of our faith, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. That is the greatness of Jesus. He not only came with a cure, but he administered it to us for our eternal life that we may be saved from sin and brought into his house. Let us consider this. Let us be drawn in by this good news. We were dead men walking and he gave us life. When you mess up this week and fail in what you know to be right and you do things that you know are wrong, you may grieve over your sin, but do not be devastated. Know that Jesus has administered the antidote. He has saved you from the eternal results of your sin. And so you can rejoice in him if you believe in him. Allow this knowledge to continually draw you closer to him. Allow this knowledge to transform your actions to become more like Jesus. Don't allow this knowledge to falsely assure you that a life of sin is okay or good. Jesus died so that you might be freed from sin, not bound to it. So let's read verses two to five. We'll get through these quickly here. Verses two to five, uh, keeping, in the, keeping in mind that the author is still speaking about Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. So the author goes on to say that this Jesus who is both the apostle of God the Father and the high priest of the people, or you could say both the maker and the administrator of the antidote to our sin problem, 
He is faithful. He always does what he says he will do. He commits to doing what he has promised. That is the definition of faithful. He does what he says he will do. And the author here uses the example of Moses. Now, to some of you, this will mean nothing, but to the Jewish people, Moses was their hero of old. Moses was the one who had led the Israelites out of slavery uh, from Egypt some 1,500 years before this text was written. Moses was the man that God had used to deliver the Old Testament law to uh, these Jewish people. Moses had met with God on a mountain while the rest of the Israelites had built an, a golden idol down below. Moses was the faithful one, and he was renowned among the Jews. He was the faithful hero who had delivered them from slavery and given them God's Old Testament law. And the author says that Jesus is even more faithful than Moses. And he's trying to help these people see how great Jesus is. Don't turn away. Moses still made mistakes. He still sinned. And as much as he was revered as a hero, he was still only human. He wasn't perfectly faithful. He was but a mere shadow of the true and better hero to come. The one who would be perfectly faithful to God the Father. Jesus Christ. And the author uses the analogy of a house. Moses was a faithful member of God's household, but Jesus was the perfectly faithful, faithful member of God's household. In fact, Jesus wasn't only a member of the household. He was the designer and the builder of the household. Moses was created by Jesus. And as such, the creator of this faithful Moses is worth far more glory than Moses, the one who was created. It's like having a song, this song that we might like by a certain band. We want to go see them in concert. We want to meet the lead singer. We want to meet the one who created this beautiful art. The artist gets more glory than the work that he creates as the crowd is screaming out when the hit song starts to play during the concert. And the author of the book of Hebrews here is telling these people, you guys want to go back to Moses and his Old Testament law but Jesus created Moses. You have Jesus, the creator of Moses, whom you consider to be so faithful and good. Don't go back to the art when you have an audience with the artist. The one who created Moses is far greater and far more faithful than the one that he created. Moses was only ever designed to point you back to the one who created him. Jesus is the ultimate faithful one. He followed God the instru Father's instructions perfectly to come to earth and to save for himself a people. He never disobeyed God the Father, unlike Moses, who struck the rock out of anger in the desert when God had instructed him to speak to the rock so water could come forth and save the people from dying of thirst. Jesus is the true and better Moses. Follow Jesus. Don't go back to, the Mo to Moses and the Old Testament law that was delivered through him, Jesus brought a better law, and he administers it perfectly. The last verse of our text, verse 6, puts it this way. But Jesus is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we indeed hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Jesus is faithful over his household. You and I, if we trust in him for our salvation, are his household. And Jesus is faithful over us like a son, not a servant. You see, a son is faithful over a household because he knows that in time it will one day be his. And so he takes care of it with the utmost care and planning so that it is of the most possible value when he takes over from his father. Moses, however, wasn't the one and only son of God. He took care of God's household like a servant. It was not Moses' house, so he took care of it imperfectly. He didn't care as much about the household of God as Jesus because he was like a servant, not a son. That's why Jesus is better than Moses. This is why these people should trust Jesus rather than the Moses of the Old Testament law, or rather than Moses and the Old Testament law that came through him. Moses and the Old Testament law were good, but now Jesus is far better. So endure till the end. Put up with the suffering in this life and endure 
Jesus is faithful. He will do what he has said. He has come to you with the antidote for your sin, and he has administered that antidote for you. So trust him. If you are a part of his house, he has you in his hand. He will not let you go. He is faithful as one who will inherit all that the father has, including us, his brothers and sisters, his household. He allows us to share in it. Now, you, you might be thinking, why does this even matter? Why does it matter that Jesus is perfectly faithful? Why does it matter that he's better than Moses? Why does it matter that Jesus was perfectly faithful to God the Father and did all that he asked of him? And what does it have to do with me today? How does this knowledge of Jesus' faithfulness help me in my suffering? How does it help me in my hardships? How does it help me through illness? How does it help me through poverty? How does it help me in my failure and in my sin? How does the truth about Jesus change how I view my circumstances and how can it give me joy? I want to go to John chapter 6 and let's read verses 38 to 40 to find out what Jesus is faithful in doing for his father and why this is life changing for you. This is Jesus speaking here, John chapter 6, verses 38 to 40. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This all matters to you. Because Jesus is faithful in taking care of those who are his. If you're going through a rough time, remember, if you believe in him, you are in his hands, and he is the one who's going to raise you up on the last day. When you're going through a difficult day, when you can't seem to do anything right, and you fail yet again, and you think you're not worthy of Jesus, you're right, but take comfort and find joy in this that you don't have to save yourself. Jesus did it. and He did it for you. It's finished. When you're sure that you have sinned far more than God could ever forgive, then remember, Jesus has paid for it all. He, co- he came to earth bringing the antidote for your sin overdose. He shed his blood and he administered the antidote for you so that you may have life. You can trust him. He has done this. If you believe in him, he has done this for you. You can find peace in knowing you are his and that he takes care of his own. When you're overcome with the responsibilities of life and you feel you cannot carry on, remember, Jesus has you in his hands You may not have the ability you desire nor the answers that you want or the things that you think you need. But remember, he's not just sitting on the sidelines cheering you on saying you can do it. He has jumped right in and he's doing it for you. He will bring you to the finish line. You can rest in that. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. He is faithful to bring all those who believe in him to his eternal home, giving them eternal life. If you believe in him, rest in that. Find peace in that. We have eternal life not because we deserve it, but because Jesus is that good to us. So let's have confidence in Jesus and not in ourselves. Let's boast in him, as verse 6 says. Our confidence and our boasting ought to always be of how great Jesus is that he would let a wretched person such as you and me into his kingdom. Let's not boast in ourselves or our good works because as we live our lives, we're going to realize that our good works aren't that good and we're going to become devastated when we realize we cannot live up to what we boast about in ourselves. And we're going to be overcome with despair when we realize we failed. Let us boast in Jesus. 
the one who has done it for us, and let us with all our hearts follow him and love him and worship him for this great privilege of being able to be a part of his family because he has made it possible to live with him for eternity. These Jews thought Moses was so great and they wanted to go back to the Old Testament law that had come through him. And he was pretty good. But Jesus is infinitely better. You might be like these Jews and have these thoughts, if only my life could go back the way it was, if only I could fix my relationship with my parents, or if only I could fix the relationship um, with my boss or with my spouse. Maybe things should have turned out better in our marriage, and maybe if I could go back and do things better, that would be good. And, I'll, and as good as all those things are, they're, they're not our saviors. A, a good relationship with your parents is good, and a marriage that's strong is good. A relationship with your boss is good, but none of those things are permanent. At some point, all those things break down. You might retire from your job and not see your boss ever again, or you might find a new job that's better. Or maybe a spouse passes away and you don't get to see them again. Or maybe your parents move away and you don't see them very often anymore. None of those relationships are perfect or are permanent. Although good, they are fleeting compared to Jesus. Jesus is better. And if all those things right now in your life are messed up, know this, that Jesus has you in his hands and he will not let you go. You are in his household forever. He is the faithful son who takes care of you, and you can have peace in knowing this. The more you know Jesus, the more peace and confidence you're going to have in his ability to do all that he says. He is perfectly faithful to do all that he has promised. Will you trust him today? He has the antidote to the problem of your sin overdose, and with that antidote, you are given citizenship and adoption into his family. He died on the cross, shed his blood to pay for your sin and to adopt us into his family if we believe this good news. Jesus, I just want to thank you for all that you have done for us. I thank you for bringing us the cure for our eternal disease. And I thank you for administering the cure for us when we couldn't do it on our own. And for this, we owe you everything. Even though everything we are and everything we have could never be enough to repay you for the debt that we owe, we thank you for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. In your name, Jesus. Amen.